Hey everyone and welcome to the second instalment of Talkable tonight. Um, firstly, my apologies that I'm two weeks late in delivering this one to you guys. Um, we were all very sick in our house a couple of weeks ago. So um, it's coming to you better late than never. Um, everyone's well um, and I'm hoping that you had a lovely break over Easter. We have well and truly eaten more than our fair share of chocolate in our house. So today we're going to be talking all about ear infections and how they impact language learning. Um, so like I, like I said, ear infections are super common and but often parents uh, and ask me, you know, how might this be affecting my child's language development? So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, I'm not entirely sure how long the presentation will go for. Um, I haven't given this presentation before. Um, but I will be hanging around uh, even after the presentation's finished so that I'll be able to answer any questions you might have. Um, ask me questions as we go along. I'm going to try and have the Facebook feed up as we go. Um, and if I don't get to your questions as I'm talking, I'll definitely answer them at the end. Uh, I have a few questions that have come in by email over the last few weeks. But if you have any questions for me, then please feel free to post them in this video content, um, in the comments box, sorry, I should say. So we've got a, a, some videos to watch tonight, a little bit of a presentation, uh, hopefully I won't do too much talking, um, but you can watch some videos about ear infections and also some videos of myself with Ella um, uh, playing some listening games. All right, so I am hopeful that all the audio and visuals work well tonight. It's been a little while since I've been on the webcam uh, and I'll just flick over to the presentation now. All right, so you should be able to see my screen there. Um, and it's all, uh, I'll run through the presentation as we go. Um, clicking along. So this is what we're going to cover today, um, a little bit about how we actually hear because once we understand how we hear, we can really understand the impact of fluid in the middle ear and what that can happen, what, what can happen to hearing when the fluid's there. We'll talk about conductive hearing loss, which is exactly that. It's, it's issues with the sound being conducted from the outer ear through to the cochlea. Um, how to pick up signs of an ear infection. Some of you out there will have had more than your fair share of ear infections in your house. Um, so you'll be experts at picking up these signs. Um, but what to do really if you think your child has an ear infection? Uh, what well, the treatments are for ear infections and what you know doctors may advise. Um, and then we'll talk about the impact on speech and language development. And then finally, how to help um, some really practical strategies for helping children who are finding it difficult to hear or have had periods of hearing uh, mild hearing loss, um, how we can really encourage those kids to learn to listen um, through everyday kind of play scenarios. And then at the end, like I said, plenty of time for questions. All right, let's go. So I've got a couple of videos here that um, we can watch together and they just talk about one, the first one will be around how we actually hear, how children hear, and the second one will be simulating a bit of what an ear infection looks like and also simulating what that might sound like for your child if they have an ear infection. Okay. Our world is full of infinite sounds, but how do we actually perceive them? Sounds are collected by the outer ear, which consists of the auricle and the external auditory canal. The sound is guided through the ear canal to the middle ear. The sound arrives at the eardrum, a flexible circular membrane, which starts to vibrate when sound waves strike it. The sound waves are passed on by the movement of the eardrum to the middle ear. In the middle ear are three tiny bones, referred to as the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. Collectively, they are known as the acicular chain. I might just pause it there. I just want to point out to you the part of the ear that we're talking about when we're talking about ear infections. And so like the video is showing, the sound waves are coming in here and this part in here is called the middle ear. Okay, and you can see there's a tube down here. That's called the eustachian tube. We'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, but basically when a child has a middle ear infection and there's fluid in the ear, all of this cavity here can be full 
of fluid. And when we say fluid, we're really talking about mucus, snot, whatever you might, might call it. All these mucus membranes, when a child has a virus, are producing mucus. Um, and so they, this area here is filling up uh, with yucky um, mucus. And, and that's in, impacting the ability for for firstly the eardrum to vibrate because there's fluid in here so it can't move as freely and also for it to vibrate any of these small bones here. These form a bridge from the eardrum to the entrance of the inner ear. Their interaction increases and amplifies the sound vibrations further before these are relayed fully into the inner ear via the oval window. In the inner ear is the cochlea which is similar in shape to a snail shell. It contains several membranous sections which are filled with watery fluids. When the sound waves vibrate the oval window, the fluid begins to move, thus setting minute hair cells in motion. These hair cells then transform the vibrations into electrical impulses, which are sent via the auditory nerve and onto the brain. What we call noises are actually just sound waves which are transmitted through the air. All right, so that was really about how we actually hear uh, and the process of hearing. So we've got an idea of, you know, sound waves moving through, vibrating that eardrum, making those little um, bones move, which are then uh, stimulating the cochlea um, and turning those sound waves into electrical impulses that go to our brain. So let's have a quick look about ear infections and conductive hearing loss. And at the end of this, there'll also be like a simulation that, that tries to kind of show you what it would be like for your child when they're listening to you, if they do have a mild conductive hearing loss or a moderate conductive hearing loss. All right, here we go. Fluid buildup in the middle ear is common in infants and young children. One common reason is the size and position of the eustachian tube. If this tube becomes swollen or blocked, often due to a cold, negative pressure may start to develop inside the middle ear. So just pausing it there, when I was talking about these eustachian tubes previously, um, the thing that has just been mentioned in this video is the size and the position. So that's another big factor of why children get ear infections uh, more frequently than adults. Children have much narrower eustachian tubes, you know, all their sinuses, all their, um, all of their, um, I guess even their nasal cavity, all those things are a lot smaller, so they get blocked a lot more easily. When they swell up with an infection, again, they're going to be even more susceptible to getting blocked. Um, and the other thing is with, with a child, due to the shape of their head, the eustachian tubes are a lot more horizontal, which means that it's much harder for fluid to drain out. As the child grows into an adult, the eustachian tubes elongate and they become more vertical which means that they're much easier to clear when they do have fluid in there. Over time, this may cause fluid or mucus to build up inside the middle ear. This makes it harder for the eardrum and the middle ear bones to move properly and for sound vibrations to reach the inner ear. This can cause a temporary conductive hearing loss until the middle ear fluid goes away on its own or is treated. To give you an idea of what speech might sound like if your child has conductive hearing loss, we have prepared a hearing loss simulation. It's cold outside. Can you please bring me your socks? All right. So that how was that for a um simulation there as well about what children may be hearing if they have a hearing uh, a mild or moderate hearing loss. Um, typically a child with um, a lot of fluid in the ear may have up to a moderate hearing loss um, but they might be frequently having a mild hearing loss if um, if they are having ear infections and fluid build up in that middle ear for 
a long period of time. And you could see that it was really hard to hear what the what the person was saying and that can really have an impact on lots of things including their attention, their ability to hear different speech sounds and their ability to imitate words. All right, so firstly, ear infections are probably one of the most common childhood illnesses um, because you know what, kids get sick all the time and when kids get sick and they get viruses and all of their mucous membranes are swelling up and they're producing a lot of fluid, there's a really high chance that they'll get fluid in their ears. Um, and, and here are some of the signs, you, you will know these, these will be familiar to you. So they're going to be pulling at their ears um, and they might be more upset than usual. They might have a fever, but they don't always have to have a fever to have um, fluid in their ears. And we can talk about that a little bit more, that sometimes this fluid actually persists for a long time after the child is actually over the most acute phase of the, of the uh, virus. Um, and it's, it's the same with, you know, a child has a runny nose for a prolonged period. They can have fluid in there. And the thing is that it can get trapped in there and it can really thicken and it can be really hard to drain out of those eustachian tubes because that's the only way it's going to come out. It's either going to get absorbed back by the body or it's going to uh, need to come out the eustachian tubes. Um, so your child might not be uh, responding to sounds. They can also have trouble with their balance if they've got fluid in their middle ear. Trouble sleeping. This was a massive one in our household for my second daughter. So, you know, she'd be kind of fairly happy the moment I went to lay her down that increase in pressure as her head went down on down on the mattress she would cry and cry and cry and so sleeping was was really hard when she had colds any kind of um, fluid um, and in some instances children may even have fluid draining out of the ear and we see that when a child actually has a perforated eardrum or when the ear you know when the eardrum has had such a degree of um, infection behind it that it is swollen so much it cannot take it anymore and it bursts the eardrum. Now what can happen in those situations is that the child experiences extreme pain but as soon as it bursts it can be a bit of a relief because they get that the pressure is gone. Um, and look, on occasion that is not too problematic, but if a child is having repeated ear infections and they're bursting the eardrums, then it can lead to scarring and that can lead to more permanent damage to the eardrum. Um, so I guess the take home from today is I really want you to, to think that if you if you have any um, suspicion your child has an ear infection or fluid in their ear, behind their um, eardrum, get the GP to just have a look. And um, I always say, uh, Whenever I go to the doctors, for whatever reason, um, with my kids, I, I always get them to have a look in their ears. I just want to know that there's um, no fluid behind there, that they're healthy and that, you know, they should be hearing well. All right. So treating ear infections, the main thing, first of all, obviously providing pain relief to your child. Uh, always, always, always visit your GP. Um, with little kids, we take ear infections really seriously um, and babies can get some nasty infections and can actually spread to the bones around the ear um, and we just don't want they're, they're so tiny those little ear middle ear um, bones that we always want to know that um, that there's no fluid in there usually majority of times um, ear infections are called caused by viral infections so in actual fact antibiotics aren't um, going to help in those instances so in those cases, what we want to do, we want to go to the doctor if there is signs that it is uh, a more nasty infection, then they may prescribe antibiotics, but otherwise they will wait, they'll have a look, they'll wait for the fluid to drain. Um, and most of, mostly it will resolve on its own without further treatment. However, so this is for children who are having them occasionally, um, but for children who are having recurrent ear infections associated with, with lots of pain, having burst eardrums, um, we, the doc, your GP will recommend that you see an ear, nose and throat specialist. Um, and they are the people that will then decide whether um, your child will be a good candidate for grommets. Just wanted to show you on that slide there, we've got a picture of the eustachian tubes, which is again, I keep talking about these eustachian tubes. Um, you might be more familiar that if you're um, flying in an aeroplane and you pop your ears, that's the feeling of pressure equalizing through your eustachian tubes to your middle ear. 
okay? Or you might move your jaw or whatever, those, that popping sound, and that's you opening up your eustachian tube and equalizing pressure in your middle ear. So kids aren't great at doing that, which is also why uh, flying with kids is not great. But you can see there, in an infant, almost horizontal. So once that gets um, in that middle ear there, once that gets jammed up, this closes up with, an, with a um, virus, then it is really hard for that to, to drain. As you grow to, to be an adult, those eustachian tubes do become more elongated and more ver um, vertical, which means that they can drain a lot easier. Kids are prone to getting sick, aren't they? They just um, they pick things up from childcare, from playgroup. They are putting things in their mouth. Um, they're exploring the world and they haven't built up their immune system either. So they're going to get sicker a lot, which means they're likely to get um, middle ear infections more frequently. All right, so just really quickly, I wanted to explain what grommets were. Lots of parents are like, well, what are grommets? What do they actually do? Uh, we also call these ventilation tubes, and this is all, uh, I guess, the role of the ear, nose, and throat surgeon would be looking at um, letting you know whether this would be something that your child needed. Um, it is a general anaesthetic procedure and so it's not always recommended you know grommets are not always the answer sometimes monitoring um, your child's hearing is is uh, your child's middle ear uh, over a period of time is is recommended uh, but like I said <clears throat> for those children who are having recurrent problems with their middle ear lots of pain lots of infection um, lots of trouble hearing then they do sometimes recommend grommets it's a very very small tube that's placed through the eardrum so you can imagine how how tiny that is um uh, it's done in a general anesthetic by an ent surgeon and it, it just allows the fluid that is sitting in the middle ear to drain out and sometimes within the surgery they'll actually suction out any fluid that's in there um and then it, over time they just work their way out okay and then the eardrum will close over that hole and then re repair that part of the eardrum. The rest, while the grommet's in there, the rest of the eardrum can vibrate uh, and, and work uh, typically, um, so it doesn't impede hearing in that case. The only precaution is that you cannot submerge your head in water, and you'll often see kids at the swimming pool with those big bands around their head, and they'll have earplugs and the big bands. That's just protecting the, their ears while they've got grommets in. All right, so, okay, that's all about hearing and that's all about how do we hear um, and uh, you know how to how does it affect how do middle ear infections um, affect hearing like I said if you go if we look at that um, think back to that simulation that mild to moderate that that can be the level the degree of hearing loss a child has when they're at the uh, when they have a lot of fluid in there um, you, you it's Middle ear infections are sometimes referred to as otitis media, uh, an otitis media with effusion, and that means uh, ear infection with fluid. And that fluid, like I said, that can sit around for a long time after that acute infection has gone away or that viral infection's uh, finished. And that's the thing we need to keep following up. And if you if your doctor has any concerns, they'll also refer you to an audiologist. And I really recommend that. You go and see those the audiologists who who will repeatedly check your child's hearing over a period of time to make sure that they are recovering from these periods of of middle ear infection. Um, the, the other things to look at uh, in terms of what impact are they having uh, are is your child late to talk? So you know your child's had these uh, ear infections and they're not really quite meeting their language milestones. You know, they're, they're not really babbling as much as other babies. They don't seem interested in, in making sounds. They might not be, um, their first words might not be coming at around 12 months. And by 18 months, you know, we're looking at a vocabulary of about 20 words. So for a child that's had recurrent, repeated ear infections, they may be late to talk. They may not be you know paying as much attention to what you're saying therefore they might find it harder to understand words as well and follow directions and things like that um the other thing we see a lot in the clinic as well is speech sounds can be impacted so if you go back again to those language simulations of what it sounds like if you have a, an, an ear infection and a mild or moderate conductive hearing loss though it's it is hard to hear the difference between some speech sounds and some really high frequency speech sounds like that's they may all sound quite similar 
or you might not really even hear them at all. So what you're hearing are the lower sounds, okay? Almost like you're hearing underwater. Um, so speech sound development may be a little bit different or it may be a little bit delayed. And also auditory processing skills can be impacted. And when we talk about auditory processing skills, it's things like um, being able to um, make sense of the sounds that are coming you know, that we're hearing, being able to um, switch off all the background noise and only listen to speech. That's challenging for kids anyway. For a child who's had lots of ear infections and, and hearing loss, um, mild or moderate, they, they find that really hard. You know, they're hearing, when they are hearing well, they don't know what they should be listening to. They're hearing the noisy traffic. They're hearing the birds. They're hearing the radio, the TV, and your speech all at the same time. And they're not learning to kind of discriminate and pick out what's the important stuff to listen to. So auditory processing skills can be impacted. We talk about auditory memory as well. So that's the ability to be able to listen to a few things and keep them in our memory while we make sense of them. So that can be challenging and also attention and focus. Um, you know, if someone's talking, um, sometimes children who have had lots of ear infections and have had um, that, that difficulty hearing find it harder to pay attention to talking because the, it, they don't, it doesn't make as much sense to them. They might be more visually orientated, so they're learning more visually because their auditory sense has been impacted, um, but they, they then need to learn to listen. I guess. So attention to speech, attention to when someone else is talking and engaging with them might be harder for them. They might, might be more likely to be the doers, the ones that want to learn through doing. All right. So we talked about this in the last session, but just really quickly. So your child's had ear infections, but you think they're going okay or you're not quite sure. And certainly lots of kids will have ear infections and they'll track along fine. You know, those ear infections will resolve quickly enough that it's not going to impact them in a big way long term. But these, like I said, quickly, I've, I've been over these previously, these are the milestones we should be looking out for. And if your child's not meeting these, then it's definitely worth ch chatting to a speech pathologist. So six to 12 months, we want to see them making lots of sounds, being interested in you talking, moving their head when they hear a sound towards whatever's making the sound, um, and then really starting to learn some words between 12 and 18 months. So by 18 months, we want 20 words that they use all the time consistently to mean, uh, to mean with meaning. Um, so if they're not doing that and they're not really interested in talking at 18 months, I'd be seeking a bit more help there. And by two, we want to see a good vocabulary. We want at least 100 words, um, putting those words into short phrases of two or three words. If they're not doing that or if their speech is really unclear, again, seeking help. So by two years, you as parents should be able to understand pretty much everything your two-year-old says, pretty much, unless they're talking about something that's really out of context and you're not sure. But And a stranger should be able to understand your two-year-old about half of the time. Okay, um, by three, you, even an unfamiliar listener should understand your child pretty much all of the time. Okay, so those are kind of some of our red flags um, for what we should be um, what we should be looking for. All right, next up, just checking that I haven't had any questions come in through Facebook. Um, no, no, so I'm just a share there. Okay, cool. So, how to help? This is the most important stuff, isn't it? Because you know what? Kids are going to get ear infections. And unfortunately, there isn't really a lot we can do about it. But we can help by changing the environment and by giving them some really good opportunities to learn language. All right. Sounds really basic but really important. Get your child's attention before you talk to them. And I do, I, for any child, I recommend doing this. If you're going to engage with them, uh, you want to make sure they're looking at you. You want to make sure that, you're t that, they're, that they're paying attention and focusing. Now, you can do that by just gently touching them. You could say their name first. You want to get within their vision and you want to get down to their level. Okay? Let them finish off doing what they're doing and then wait for them to, to turn to you. Okay, so get their attention before you start talking. Otherwise, we start talking, uh, your child's missed the first bit because they've been engaged in something else and when we're talking about auditory processing, learning to listen, we want to teach them, hey, look at the person that's talking, 
that's where the information's coming from. That's where you're going to help. That person's going to help you understand what's going on. Um, use lots of visual cues. Now, this can be lots of things. Facial expression. If you're excited or if something exciting happens, show them, oh, wow, so exciting. If something's a bit sad or the dolly's upset or the teddy's sad, show them the teddy's sad. So using that facial expression, that's a really good visual cue. Make your body do what you're telling your child. Okay, It's going to help them understand. Gestures and keyword signs is a great one. So just natural gestures is a visual cue. So you are talking about the teddy. Have teddy here. Point to teddy when you say teddy. Um, you can use real objects within your world as well. Gestures like waving when you say bye, pointing to things, shrugging, saying where. Um, and there's lots of other natural gestures that you will use naturally during your day. Um, things like drink, you might be doing this. Keyword signs are just a bit more of a formal system of gestures. Um, and you might have heard of baby sign and things like that. Keyword signs is, is a system that speech pathologists would use if we were helping children that might need some of those more visual cues. Um, so keyword signs is based on Australian sign language and basically the premise is you do a sign and you say the word at the same time. But that can be a really helpful way of helping children, particularly if they've had periods of not hearing really well, to help them understand what you're talking about. Okay? Uh, pictures. So books, you know, if you're reading to a child and you're talking about the picture, as you're talking, point. So point to what you're saying. Point to uh, the dog. Oh, look, the dog's eaten all of the cheese, whatever it is. Point as it's happening. Uh, oh, that mummy looks sad. Point at the mum's face as you're saying those words. Um, and you can use other pictures in your environment all around you. You know, there are signs. Um, there might be pictures in magazines. Whatever pictures you can find in your environment, they are all visual cues uh, and real objects. So this helps any child learning language. You know, if I'm talking about a banana, I want to have the banana there. I want to be showing them that yes, this is a banana, this is what I'm talking about. Um, if I'm asking them if they want uh, water or crackers, show them those things. They're the real life, um, the real objects, okay? Um, reduce background noises and visual distraction. So this is a really important one. If we're teaching our kids, helping them learn how to listen, then I want you to be, to be turning off the TV. I want you to turn off the radio. I want you to turn off all of those extra sounds so that your child doesn't have to work as hard to listen to you. And this goes for, you know, for children, just any child learning to listen. Remember that only just come into this world, we have to actually help them learn how to discriminate um, what is important to listen to and what is background noise. And visual distractions too. If children have had ear infections and a bit of hearing loss, and I, like I said before, they're visual learners, they're going to be much more drawn visually to what's happening in their environment so what we want to we really want to do is reduce those visual distractions put away your phone you know if you're playing together maybe not have as many toys out have one toy or a choice of two when they finish pack that away and bring out a new one um, because we want to be reducing those visual distractions uh, avoiding noisy environments when we can when we're learning language so you know trying to get to quieter places when you're having those learning opportunities and when, it, when you're really chatting to each other. All right. Now, some activities. What can we actually do to encourage listening skills? So this is kind of the next step. Once we know that kids, you know, when kids, and I do this with all children, but if children are finding it hard, difficult to listen and pay attention to what they hear, then make it fun. So I talk all the time about what I can hear and I did this from the moment my kids were born. So, you know, I'd have a tiny baby in my arms, there'd be a magpie singing outside, I'd talk about it. Oh, listen, it's a bird. And then just pause and pause and, and let them hear that sound. Or, oh, noisy truck, that's a motorbike. I hear an aeroplane. You know, our environments are super noisy all the time. And, you know, the phone's ringing, lots of things are going on. 
point that out to your child and you can do things like you know when you're going for a walk you can go for a sound walk and listen see what sounds you can listen to as you're walking along <clears throat> uh, play sound localizing games this is really fun and I'll show you a video in a moment with Ella and I doing this um, but, but that's basically hide and seek with something that makes noise so it might be your phone with an alarm on it uh, a wind up music box or something like that you hide it and then you get your child to find it so they have to listen out for where that sound's coming from they have to think you know get rid of all their background distractions and really hone in on that and if your child can't do it obviously you help them find find that um, but you can do this with really small babies too when they start to move about anything that makes noises you know you could have a squeaky toy that you hide underneath or bells that you shake underneath uh, a blanket and then pull it over to show them that that's what it is um, even making funny noises when you play so lots of sound effects animal noises all those really funny things we want kids to want to listen to us so we have to be fun we have to be engaging we have to be silly um, so making funny noises when you play Surprise bag games, again, in the video that's just about to come up, you'll see Ella and I doing this. You know, you might have some toys or instruments hidden in a bag. So you've taken away that visual element. Your child can no longer see the object. They have to listen. So they might listen to you making the animal noise of corresponding to what's in there. Or this, you might be able to shake the bag and or the box or whatever, and it might make a noise on its own. So it might be bells or a shaker or any of those things. So that's another thing you can do. Play instruments and sing songs together. I think instruments are such a great toy for kids to have. You can go to your local music shop, get little egg shakers, super cheap, bells, some of them, and, you know, good quality things that don't cost a lot of money. Uh, and they're so much fun for kids to play with and to learn to listen. Uh, and you can make your own shakers. And that's something in the videos coming up. Um, and singing songs together is another great one that encourages listening skills because, again, kids are so engaged by um, songs. And when we're singing and we're doing actions, our actions and our words usually match. Open, shut them, open, shut them. You know, heads, shoulders, knees and toes. We're, we're saying those words as we're pointing to them. We're singing, we're animated, and kids will be so engaged with that. So I, I look singing to kids, singing to babies, singing to toddlers, singing to preschoolers is such a fantastic way to help them learn language. All right, so there's a few little ideas here with myself and Ella playing together. I might pause as we go through just to make a few comments, um, but let me just transition this over to you guys and enjoy watching Ella and I play together. And you can see Ella is really engaged in this and she's engaged with me. You know, she's looking back to me. She's co was copying my actions at that time earlier too. So I was saying where? <gasps> Lots of animation from me when she finds it. And you can see me using other visual cues there. I'm doing some hand signs. Old MacDonald had a farm. E-I-E-I-O. <gasps> so I'm not telling her what animal it is. I'm just making the sound. She the Kids are super engaged with surprise bags <laughs> because they can't see what it is. It's so exciting. All right, this is just Ella and I have literally put some beans in a plastic bottle. And she's learning that those beans make sounds. And that when she turns it up, 
And when she taps on the table, it makes a different sound again. That's auditory processing. That's learning to listen. Great for imitation. All right, so some just really practical um, games and strategies for you to try with your little one. Um, I love adding in some of that language stuff too. So you can see at the end there we were talking about um, far, you can do, you know, stop and go. It's really tangible when you're shaking something really quite loudly and all of a sudden you, you stop that sound and you say the word stop. So it has a really big impact. Um, and again, loud and quiet. And you could see I was doing some hand signs with that too. I, I was giving her a choice between loud and quiet. Um, she got a bit confused, but I corrected myself once she she actually was like, no, no, I don't want loud, I want quiet. Um, so I was just watching it, watching her visual cues too. Um, but they are all really great ways to get her to tune in to what's happening, what she's hearing in her environment. It doesn't always have to be speech sounds. It can be music, uh, it can be environmental noises can be noises that her own she's making with her own body with tapping and clapping and things like that. All right, so if you think your child has trouble hearing, if they've had repeated ear infections, if you just are not sure if they can hear, what do you do? First thing is go to your GP. Uh, they will always look in your child's ears. If they don't, always ask or find another GP that does. Um, and they will then make the decision as, as to whether they think an ear, nose and throat specialist needs to be involved. All right. Uh, I will say sometimes with GPs also, if you, you know, the ear infections and fluid can develop quite quickly over time. So you might go when your child's feeling actually really horrible and sick early on uh, and there might not be much fluid there yet um, or there might not be much happening in the middle ear. So it might not be a few till a few days later that that ear infection can be picked up. So you might have to go back to the GP. Trust your gut instinct, mums and dads. You know if there's something going on in that ear. If you're seeing those signs of pulling and, and being really uncomfortable, then just keep going back and asking your GP about it. Ear, nose and throat specialists, they are the ones that will take a, a, you know, a, a closer look inside your child's ears and make the decisions around whether any further interventions needed. But also an audiologist is important too. So any concerns that there have been problems with hearing, getting the, the audiologist to do a hearing assessment, okay? And you know what? Some parents are like, no, no, he can hear me fine. You know, if the door slams, he can hear or whatever. But it's actually not that simple because, yes, children, even with, with a mild or even with a moderate conductive hearing loss, will hear those big noises, but they won't hear quiet noises. They might not hear all the speech sounds, especially the high frequency sounds. They might be missing those things. So it's it's not just about black or white, they, oh, they can hear or they can't hear. It's what can they hear of, of the speech spectrum. What sounds are they missing? What can they hear? And that's what an audiologist will do. They'll look at all of those sounds from the really high frequency to the low frequency and test where your child's hearing, um, what their capacity is. And if you have concerns about language delay or speech sound development, the best thing is to go see a speech pathologist. Um, you can see one publicly or privately. Um, they, they are all fantastic. The only thing is usually you will have to wait longer for public services. Um, so you might decide to see someone privately. Um, if you want more info on that, you just message me. The Speech Pathology Australia have a fantastic find a speech pathologist function on their website so you can find someone local to you. All right, anyone can refer, you can refer yourself to a speech pathologist, even to the public system. You can get your name down on the waiting list. The other thing that I have is an app. It is called Talkable and you can get it on Android or iPhone. And it goes through 10 weeks 
of language learning. So not specific to children who have um, difficulty hearing, but these strategies are, are ones that are going to help with their language development. So you can um, also check that out. That is for sale on the app stores for $4.50. Um, so yes, please have a look at that if you're interested. Um, and also my website, talkable.org.au, heaps of resources on there. It's all free. Have a look at what's on there um, uh, on the website. Okay, we've come to question time. Um, please feel free if you are listening to this live to type up any questions you have for me. If you don't feel like typing them up publicly, you can always email me. So email karen at talkable.org.au. I promise I'll get back to you within a few days um, and point you in the right direction if you have some really specific questions. Let me just open up my Facebook page so I can see what's happening uh, on there. Okay, so I have had a couple of questions come in during since I last uh, spoke to you guys. Interestingly, quite a few on stuttering. I'm not sure what is in the water at the moment, but I've had a few parents just get in touch saying, help, my three-year-old's just started stuttering overnight. I don't know what I should be doing. Should I be worried? What should I do? Help, help, help. Uh, it's made me think I might actually do a talkable tonight on stuttering because it is a common thing. Uh, you know, a lot of children in the preschool years will stutter. Um, so I might do something on that. But just briefly, um, the question that came in was for a three-year-old who ha was stuttering um, a few times a day. So it was noticeable, um, but not um, necessarily something that was impacting him all the time. Uh, my questions to mum first of all, were, okay, is there a family history of stuttering? Because if we know someone else in your family stutters, it's more likely that the child may have a persistent difficulty and may need intervention. So if there's any family history, we do not wait at all. We jump on that and we get in really quickly. Uh, and how distressed was the child? So if this is causing significant distress, um, if they're getting to the point where we call it blocking, they can't actually get any sounds out and it, they are really upset by this and it's happening all the time, um, then I would seek help for that too. Just to give you some strategies, things that you can be doing to help promote fluent speech, get over those blocks and move um, your child through. Um, if it isn't happening super frequently, uh, I guess what I would say is that lots of children stutter. Okay, It seems to be part of uh, development for many children about 75% of children will spontaneously recover. We don't know which ones. So that's the tricky thing. So what I say to parents, and I must say from personal experience, my Ella stuttered um, and she doesn't anymore, was just to keep an eye on it. Keep, start tracking it. So if they're starting to stutter, I want you to start making a note. How many times did I notice that happen today? Um, how, so, you know, how, and keep just every day, just noting down how many times, how many times. And then, you know, you can look at over the week, over the fortnight, over the month to see if it's fluctuating. Now, what for intervention, uh, we do know that intervening in the preschool years is the most effective. So we do want to get in early. That intervention relies on kids actually stuttering. Okay, so if your child's only stuttering once a day on one occasion, then they're not ready or needing that intervention. Um, but we still need to keep an eye on it because if it becomes more severe, we need to do something about it. Um, so I would say keep an eye on it and if it's not resolving in three to six months, then I would be going to seek advice and to get some more help. And what we, the, the, the um, recommended program is called the Lidcom program uh, and that is an early intervention strategy uh, for helping children who stutter. So I think that's all I needed to say around the stuttering. Um, but yeah, I think I might do a bit more of a talk about that later on because it, does, it is something that seems to come up uh, a little bit. Um, let me just see what my other question was about. And it make me a little bit bigger. Uh, oh, that's right. Yes, I had a, a, a dad actually get in touch with me and say, um, my little one is two, chatting all the time, but we cannot understand what they're saying. So seeming to really try and communicate with a lot of intent. They know what they want, seem to understand a lot uh, what's happening around them but just are really unclear with their speech um, and starting to get a bit frustrated too, which can be really hard. Uh, so I think definitely for this one, by two, what we know is that you as the parent should understand most of what they say. 
okay, by two unfamiliar li listeners. So someone that's not listening to them all the time, maybe you'll understand about half of what that your child says, um, but that you should understand most of what they say. So if by two they're trying to talk to you but you're really not understanding much of what they're saying, then it is uh, definitely an in, in indicative of needing to see seek more help and, and getting a referral to a speech pathologist or calling up a speech pathologist uh, is, is the best uh, thing to do. All right. Now, I just saw a question came up on Facebook. Let me go back to that from Leslie. It says, I self-reviewed my son at 18 months when I thought he had, he had a speech problem and then when he was two had the work done with the ENT specialist. So when we were ready, he didn't need to wait on the public system. Uh, I think that might have been a comment more than a question. But um, yes, so basically, Leslie, I think what you're saying there, Leslie, is at 18 months, you, you were a little bit worried. Uh, you knew there'd be a bit of a wait. So you thought, you know what, get on the list now make the referral at 18 months uh, and so by the time he was picked up um, and he'd had some e ENT, the work's done sounds like adenoids, tonsils, maybe grommets, had everything done there, um, that, you know, it, yeah, he didn't, he wasn't waiting once he got referred to speech. Is that right, Leslie? If there's anything else you want to ask me, um, please just type it in. But yeah, I think that's a really good point. And I often say to parents, you know, if you are concerned at 18 months and if you think my child doesn't have 20 words yet, my, you know, it is worth ref getting a referral to your child development service, to the publicly available services, um, so that you can, you know, you don't have to wait very long. I mean, sorry, you will have to wait six months, but by the time your child's two, you're not waiting from that point. You want to pick those things up early and 18 months can be a good time to, to get that referral in. All right, now no other questions have come up on Facebook Live, so I'm going to sign off, but I will be hanging around for another 10 minutes. Okay, so if there's anything you want to ask me. Oh, another question's come up from Philippa. How long would it generally be to, to wait on the public scene ENT for consult? Oh, Philippa, that is a really good question. I'm not sure uh, the answer to that, but I would probably, it, it, it can be a long wait. Um, the best person to get in touch with um, would be maybe the ENT at, if you're in Perth, um, they'd be able to tell you that at um, the kids' hospital. Um or at your local hospital, so wherever you would be referred to, um, to find out. But yeah, th there is a bit of a wait for grommets, and it and it tends to be, or even to see an ENT, it tends to be that parents are seeking those services privately, so that they um, don't wait as long. Um, unfortunately, you pay for your outpatient consults, but you, if you have private health cover, you wouldn't be paying for the surgery costs. Um, but yes, I don't know the answer to that. I can find out for you. Um, let me see what I can do to find out and I'll post that on this um, video. Okay. All right. I think that's it. I'll sign off for now. But like I said, I'll be hanging around for another 10 minutes. And if there's any questions that you have about anything to do with language, speech, development, please feel free to um, post it up on Facebook. All right. See you later.